Stanford University. The California State Legislature play a central role in creating legal and regulatory framework for us to enable the clean energy transition. With that, I would like to introduce our next panel, led by Dean Arumajinda, along with two distinguished guests, Senator Josh Becker and Senator Henry Stern. It's such an honor to have two of our leading senators and leading in the energy and climate world here with us. If you don't know the history already, and let me just state the obvious, we have Senator Henry Stern, who graduated from Cal, and we have Senator Josh Becker, who graduated from Stanford. <clears throat> and here we are. Get together. You are the inspiration for both of us to bring Stanford and Cal together to save California. There it is. <laughs> well, let, let's just start. I mean, it's such an opportunity to get into your mind to how you're thinking about the future, how you're thinking about California. So maybe I could just start with Senator Stern to just offer your, offer your, offer your sort of initial remarks and we get into some Q&A. I went into your mind. That's why we're here. I went into <laughs> Arun's mind and all of Stanford's mind. Um, these are the biggest minds in the whole world. And it, frankly, is therapeutic, I think, when you work on climate in maybe lonelier parts of, of the world. Like, you may think of Sacramento as a, as a distant place, a small rural farm town up there. But people like Josh and I, Chair Randolph, Chair Hochschild, their staff, there's a little ecosystem. But when we come into the big C here in the Bay and we're here at Stanford, it feels like, okay, maybe we can solve this. Um, I'm an environmental lawyer by trade. Um, and I, I'm proud to say one of your mentees back at, in the Berkeley days when he was up at the labs, to all you graduate students who spend time working with your professors or on my right here, uh, writing talking points for big wigs when we're organizing clean tech for Obama. I was writing his talking points and I was his intern. Okay, now I'm a senator. So just now we no, listen to him. Now yeah, we well, him. I don't I wouldn't advise that too much, but it's uh, it's a wonderful thing to work with people you look up to that are your friends, these human relationships we've got and rooms like this and the sort of you know, the real interstitial stuff is, to me, the X factor for solving this crisis. I chair the Joint Climate Committee in the state, um, and we oversee all the state's climate policies, which end up putting me in places across the world, too. I end up uh, sort of leading a lot of our UN delegations, just went to Dubai, UN Climate Week, deal with the Europeans. You end up having to have a very global mindset when running a committee like that. Um, so that's my main job. I, I represent Southern California, so I live in the San Fernando Valley, um, and we live right, like, right behind the Aliso Canyon gas field. And my district is actually home to the largest methane explosion in, uh, in U.S. history. And so we have a, we're sort of viscerally connected also, also to the fossil fuel transition. Uh, the stakes are high back home in L.A., but uh, glad to be up north. Thanks, Arun. Terrific. Senator Becker? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, as Senator Stern mentioned, yeah, we're very lucky to have folks like Chair Randolph and Chair Holtzschild uh, up in Sacramento. And it is fun to be here. I remember I saw uh, Thomas Friedman speak once, and he said, he said, I'm a translator from English to English. Um, and I, when I was running, I thought, you know, I want to be a translator between Silicon Valley and Sacramento. And when you're up in Sacramento, you're really up there. You don't get a lot of connection. So it's fun to be back. I want to thank for Arun for... Uh, inviting us. And, you know, if that, when I think big picture in California, I think we need to do four things. We need to do one, we need to produce a lot more clean energy, a lot more renewables at all levels. Uh, number two, we have to get that energy to where it needs to go, right? You think about, we talked about this last panel, when you think about a crowded highway into LA or into the Bay Area, if we can't get more throughput, then no matter what we produce, it doesn't, doesn't matter, right? So we have to get it to where it needs to go. Uh, three, we need to make much more progress 
on uh, reducing methane gas in buildings. That's commercial buildings, residential buildings. Uh, and then fourth, we need to pay more attention to industrial and ag emissions. And uh, I think we, that's why you know, we're so busy, because there's so much to do. We're really talking about transforming our entire uh, economy. And I'm happy to talk about any of those areas as we go forward. But when I look at my legislation, it's been you know, around those areas. Um, starting with one big picture piece that I did when we were in COP in, in Glasgow, which I announced, which was to get our state government to net zero by 2035. So 10 years ahead of the rest of the state. So for our own fleet, our own buildings, our own electricity, let's have the state uh, lead the way with our own purchasing power, uh, number one. Um, but then in each of those other areas, uh, making sure that we uh, can deliver energy where it needs to go, uh, with transmission that we worked on last year, SB 410, making sure that our utilities uh, actually have the resources and accountability to get stuff plugged in uh, to uh, the grid, uh, make sure we work on industrial and in areas like cement. My very first year I passed the law, actually it was the only sector of the California economy which had a net zero target for a while was our cement uh, bill. As you know, globally, cement is about 7% of emissions uh, globally uh, of carbon emissions and a lot of the, and again, the innovation is happening here, so we want the technology to happen here to lead the way to uh, net zero uh, cement. Um, had a bill around uh, um, enteric emissions from, from cows uh, last year. We ended up getting that done through the budget. So we're really looking at each and uh, every uh, aspect of carbon emissions and happy to uh, go into that a little bit today. Fantastic. Uh, we're going to open up a Q&A, but let me get you started with the following. I mean, we just heard in the previous panel some of the concerns. Um, we use a, a framing out here with an acronym called DARES. We want decarbonization, but it needs to be affordable. Mm -hmm. We need reliability. We need equity. And we need security. That's the DARES framework. So as you look at this, the balancing act out here, if you go too fast, you can get yellow jacket protesters like we saw in Paris. If you go too slow, we're not addressing climate change uh, enough. What is the role of the legislature uh, in California in addressing that? How, do you, how are you thinking about it? Senator Stern? Um, take that one first. Yeah, warily. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's real, right? I mean, we're, it's, it, it's 110 degrees at, on a September evening in Sacramento while we're making a decision whether to extend Diablo or not, the nuclear plant. And the grid is literally in full flex alert. I forget what phase we're at from ISO, but like, are the lights gonna go off in the capital itself while we're debating how to keep the lights on? And um, those are hard, imperfect, politically not very, you know, they don't work well on a postcard or a, or a speech. Um, the Biden administration at a macro level is going through the exact same difficult decisions. A world is at war. The EU is now relying on the US as its largest gas exporter, and yet we're trying to fossil fuel transition. Um, how do you make these decisions? We fired up some of our oldest gas peaker plants um, around the state in disadvantaged communities. And I was very wary of that decision, and yet the state sort of, we wrestled with it, and, and sometimes you have to own, I think, own the bad parts and, and the good. I think there's a realism that people will start to trust us if we're just straightforward with them about the scale of the challenge, and we know it won't be magic. And that if the good starts to look a lot more convenient, cheaper, uh, more reliable, if that electric car or your power bill or all those, your, your, your heating system at home is less noisy, less clunky, easy to pop in the appliance, upgrade, it feels like, okay, I just want the newest iPhone, let me get the newest car, I want the newest heater, and it starts to feel like a good thing and not a sacrifice. But I still think we lack some basic analytics that we've got on the electric side, but I still don't think we understand both the California consumer and the American consumer enough about the, the, their sensitivity around fuel and that there's almost an irrational, and this is well researched in economics, but that you pay attention to the little things you buy every day. Even if net, they're not the biggest part of your budget, if your Snickers bar used to cost you a dollar 
and now it costs you $1.30. This is why Americans still feel inflation is out of control mm. and that their lives are, and that fuels is, is, is higher than ever because your pet, you watch that ticker go off at the pump and it hurts every single time. But on a net basis, the household income in this country is stronger than it's ever been, and California consumers are actually on stronger footing than they've ever been. But it's those kinds of, it's the behavioral side of it. So I know we talked a little bit about tobacco earlier and cigarettes and that transition. I, if, I, if, I, if I could, I, I'd say this is going to be a lot harder than that because this is not something that's sort of like, oh, it'd be nice to get another pack or whatever, like something to have, but something you need, and you kind of hate buying, right? Like who likes filling up at the pump? Who likes paying their utility bill? All these things hurt. So the areas of policy that we're wrestling in, you have to be very honest, knowing that not everyone shares your enthusiasm. Not everyone wants to even be part of a climate revolution or find themselves inspired by that. They just want to like have a hot shower, eat their lunch, get to work, go through their day. And so we almost have to, in my view, be this kind of a more invisible revolution that actually doesn't feel that revolutionary, that just feels convenient and reasonable and sort of just little upgrades in the system along the way. And I think it's hard for us because I'm so passionate about these issues and it's central to my life. And even when I'm dealing with other legislators, like it's easy to talk to Senator Becker because we're both like, we've been, we've read 14 other articles about whatever, this new building decarb rule that CEC's, and then you go talk to somebody else and they're like, yeah, okay, I'm a school teacher from Modesto and I work on you know, housing. And they're like, I get you're excited, but why does this matter to me? So grounding ourselves, making hard decisions, starting to own them, and solving that affordability part early and having a strategy going in so that we can credibly promise people like the future with a clean energy economy is gonna be cheaper for you and your family than it is right now. Last stat I'll leave you with. The family's making $80,000 or less in California. Spend more than half their budget on energy. So more on food and healthcare combined, right, is spent on energy. And that's your gas bill, your electric bill, and gasoline. And that is a trap, and it's eating people alive. And I truly believe that electrification, if we do it right, uh, can free people from that trap. But we gotta, we got to remember that all the time. Fantastic. Senator Becker. Sure. Uh, a couple of things. One, um, one thing I left out in the intro, I always try to start, you know, where are we big picture in California, right? So big picture, we still about 400 million metric tons of emissions every year. We're reducing around 2 to 3% now, around 2 to 3% emissions a year. But to get to our 2030 goals, we need to be reducing about 4 to 5% a year. So we need to be moving much faster in California, despite all the amazing things we've done and are doing. And again, that's partly also a plea to all of you to focus. I know a lot of people here focus uh, federally. And in California, again, we do have this opportunity. It is still a battle every day because we are a large oil producing state. And we want to have the reliability and affordability that you mentioned. Um, it's a battle every day for us to pass legislation. But we can get things done. And we do need uh, all of your help. Um, along those lines, when you mentioned that framework. Um, you know, reliability is critical for us, also for the governor, right? Nobody wants a blackout, right? Uh, that just can't happen. And so reliability is uh, paramount um, and something we think about uh, a lot in great detail. And again, that's everything from more renewables on the grid, um, also more demand response so we can uh, get to those key moments, right? Those key 10 or so days a year. Um, but then also, again, making sure that we have, we're planning at all levels. Um, and, um, and then the affordability piece, uh, Senator Stern you know, talked about, talked eloquently about why uh, people care and what our, what our colleagues are going through, right? When they say, hey, I represent uh, mostly Latino workers making $48,000 a year. They don't think any of this stuff's for them. Well, OK, well, maybe it hasn't been for them, right? If they have to believe it is for them, for them, for her to vote for. Uh, this, this uh, you know, whatever le le the relevant legislation uh, may be. So equity is both a moral consideration, it's also a political consideration, because it really has to work for everyone in the state. They have to feel uh, the benefits. The good news is they can, to wrap up, when you, know, you put in a heat pump, as we all know here, you also get air conditioning. So yeah. you think about parts of the state 
By the way, many here, you know, I never, when I moved here, you know, 25 years ago, I didn't need air conditioner. Then I had one wall unit, and then another unit, and then a portable unit. Now we have a heat pump, so we have air conditioning. So you think about all the parts of the state that um, are getting um, really, really hot many, many days a year, that they get a heat pump, their quality of life is gonna go up. But we have to get that quality of life uh, with the affordability. So you mentioned, Senator Stern, you mentioned the federal government, President Biden, is also going through similar kinds of yeah. challenges. They have to, I mean, frankly, the whole world is going through yes. this transition. Now, the federal government has passed some important bills, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act being the second one. The first one was the infrastructure bill. Um, how are you thinking about leveraging the opportunity, and has that triggered some of the initiatives that you're thinking about? I mean, it's... It's like a gift from on high. I mean, it's the best thing that's ever happened to climate policy in my short life uh, is that that IRA in this session of Congress and this president. I mean, it's still, I, I, I grew up under Obama and thinking that that was magic, what we had back in 2009 when you built ARPA-E and we had clean tech for Obama and we did, I, I helped write Waxman Markey and we were going to solve it all. And then it was like, maybe that wasn't it. Maybe this is it, and you just need to redesign industrial policy and throw a lot of money at it. So I think, I think of the federal government now as sort of our, the banker of our biggest and boldest innovations, and we'll be there for this marketplace, even when our state budget can't flex like that, like we are right now, where we're running a deficit. We're going to have the regulatory drivers. We're going to have carbon pricing. We're going to have sectoral targets. We're going to have things that sort of drive the market from a regulatory perspective, but I think that, you know, whether it's Podesta showing up last week out in Lithium Valley and saying, let's go, and thanks to Chair Hochschild for being an early uh, preacher of, of that gospel, um, or the, the carbon removal project that Senator <coughs> Becker cut the ribbon on out in, uh, what was it, Tracy? Tracy, yeah. Um, and, you know, these things where we're going first, to know that we don't have to go it alone anymore, and it's not just on the Energy Commission to figure it out, but that there's now a tax code behind us, even with hydrogen. The federal government's proved enormously useful, especially in the Treasury guidance for giving us a pathway through hydrogen where we want to say yes, but we kind of don't know how yet they're showing us that way. So it gives us, I'd say, an ability to be a little more bullish than we'd otherwise be, because otherwise we got to ride our own budget cycles and cut, sort of self-check and, and this way we can keep dreaming and innovating big and yeah, another chunk of EV charging money just dropped last week, so more to come. I hope. To everyone from the federal government, thank you who's here. <laughs> Seriously, thank you. Keep it coming. We will spend it well, whoever you are. So, so Senator Becker, I, I know that you are very interested in introduce something for carbon removal. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about why you did that and is there an angle out here in partnering with the federal government on this? Yeah. Well, the federal government and with Stanford, thanks for your leadership. Uh, as we know, so we, uh, and this was a big fight my first year uh, in the legislature. We tried to codify carbon neutrality. Again, this wonky audience, I don't think I'm going to explain all of this to you, but we tried to quantify, uh, to codify carbon neutrality by 2045. And we only got 14 votes out of 40. And we had by 30 Democrats. We had only 14 votes to codify carbon neutrality. That just shows you how it can be a fight sometimes. Uh, then our governor really stepped up, got involved the next year, and, um, and we did pass. So we've codified carbon neutrality in the state by 2045. The way we did that, we codified 85% direct emissions reductions. By the way, carbon capture and sequestration is considered a direct emissions reduction. And then 15% carbon removal. So uh, what that would translate to is about 65 million metric tons a year of carbon removal by 2045. Our scoping plan actually calls for more. I believe it's 70 uh, to 75 million metric tons. Um, and we're basically at very, very little um, that, we've really, um, that we've really measured as, as carbon reduction, as carbon removal. So at the same time, there are a lot of promising technologies. Heirloom, Senator Stern mentioned, they're doing kind of reverse the cement process. So having limestone on trays for, for three days, actually absorbing CO2, they prove they can bury it. Um, and now they've done that at small scale, need to move to larger scale. There's ocean alkanization, there's people, there's other just direct air capture uh, that we know works. Again, the question is how do we make it all more affordable. So um, uh, my bill, and worked with Ken Branson, by my Stanford Business School classmate, uh, Ken Branson is the brains behind a lot of this, uh, is that uh, we say, okay, 
uh, we have to get, say, 65 million metric tons. So let's have polluters collectively purchase 1% of that by 2030. So polluters collectively purchase 1% of that by 2030. Um, and, and then we'll scale up over, you know, ramp that up over time, the amount that they so collectively were purchasing uh, 65 million metric tons by 2045. Of course, the belief is once we've created this market signal, then the price of all this comes down. Everyone knows they can invest in it. So this is uh, what we're trying to do. Uh, got to pass the Senate last year. It's still is sitting in the Assembly right now. Uh, and that's our best guess at, at how can we actually really create a long-term predictable market for carbon removal. Let, let me follow up on that. Um, we have seen historically yeah. that when there are federal incentives, like yeah. you know, production tax credit on wind, investment tax credit on solar, yeah. Um, that is uh, essentially a bunch of carrots from the federal yeah. government. But when there are state mandates, like yeah. renewable portfolio standard, that's a stick. Yeah. You combine the two, yeah. and then it's bankable. You can yeah. move much faster. Exactly. If you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, it's essentially a bunch of carrots. Yeah, exactly. There, there are yeah. no sticks in it. Yeah. The only stick is the meth price on methane. Yeah. Right? So given the carrots out there, yeah. what are the different sticks you're thinking of yeah. to move the, the move the needle on this, yeah. and how difficult is it to get some sticks? Yeah, well, I think that's a perfect analogy for this, because um, what Arun was referring to, the renewable portfolio standard, which if you look overall, has been our greatest source of carbon emission reduction. We said, okay, we're gonna have lots of incentives for renewable energy, but we're also gonna require utilities to purchase an increasing amount of renewables, and it was 10%, people said, no, you can't do that, and then we blew through that, then it was, uh, it was five, and then 10, 10, then 25, then 33, and then 50, now we've got 60% uh, by uh, 2045. Um, and, uh, and so, again, it was a combination of care. So that's what we're doing with this, with this carbon removal bill. And yeah, it's really up to us to do regulatory policy in a lot of these other, other areas um, as well. So one of the bills that I've been focused on is 24-7 clean energy. So we know we have lots of renewables uh, during the day. How do we make sure that we really incent and have accountability for all load-serving entities to get to 24-7 uh, clean energy. And uh, we tried a direct stick approach one day. Now we actually have a measurement. So by 2026, every load-serving entity is going to have to report every hour of the day how much energy they use and what percent is clean. So again, we're going to have good, good data. And we hope that transparency will be, will, happen, will be helpful. But I think in a lot of these areas, it's, it's that both. It's a good, great point, Arun. Or it depend, you know, a carrot can be a stick depending on how you wield it. You know, or how big your carrot is. You know, swing that around the table. <laughs> In all seriousness, uh, the oil and gas industry has said, or at least sectors have said, this is our pathway. This is how we want to transition. This is the sector we want to be the best at. We want to work in carbon removal. So someone like Senator Becker says, steps up and says, here it is. But it's not just going to be a free-for-all, right? We're going to have a, a program, and there's got to be some, there's going to be a regulatory push behind it. But it, it actually took political courage to step up and say yes to that sector and that push. Because on the other side, people are saying, I mean, in the environmental community or environmental justice community, A, we don't want to work with anyone in the oil and gas industry. And any money that anything their money touches is, is out, right? I, I, we don't want it financed by them. It's, it's blood money. But, but at some point, you've got to find a way through these regulatory programs carbon pricing that then takes that pollution money and puts it into something that's actually doing something. Like it can't just, the answer can't just be no. And so brave policy makes, with, with, with carroty sticks, uh, <laughs> ma makes people, forces people to come together and think about it. And that's when things tend to pass legislatures. Because if, if everyone's sort of awkwardly not quite there, but realize we got to do something here. That's where, that's where sort of room for that political leadership emerges. And if you're a more conservative Democrat, we don't have a ton of Republicans in this state, but we're sort of the spectrum of Democrats. But if you're a more conservative Democrat, you can say, okay, you know what? He's not giving oil and gas what they want, but he's at least trying to move their technology or these ideas forward. And then the other side, you're saying, well, it's not just a carrot. At least there's, there's some polluter pays principle here. And so it's those designs tend to work, and then they also can make you feel very lonely. So you got to be intellectually and personally sort of buoyant and courageous. So, you know, it helps. 
Well, carroty yeah. sticks, that's a new word I heard. Oh, yeah. I've, take I've that learned to the bank. Today. Yeah, take, I'll take that to the bank. <laughs> Let me ask you this. I mean, we know that incentives and carrots and sticks are important to move the needle at scale. I mean, we're talking about scale, and California yeah. has scale that once you prove it, it's a proven model. But there's sometimes friction in the system, mm -hmm. right? Uh, oftentimes. In fact, I'm dealing with this on the federal government side of trying to build infrastructure the regulatory approval process, et cetera. I know that you're, you're trying to streamline that process for transmission line building, but it, I think the bill got vetoed. Uh, so tell us how you're thinking about the role of the legislature for implementation of the policies. What new policies need to be developed to streamline and speed this up? Yeah. Well, I'll say the governor stepped up and said and proposed a number of uh, initiatives last year, and we boiled those down, and I carried uh, bill that that was that kind of was the combination of some of them, but it was you know really comprehensive. You have to look at, for example, we had California had its own Endangered Species Act before the federal act, and there were some uh, species on there that weren't on the other, and then and that weren't really endangered anymore. You know, so there's, there's like a lot of cleanup, but there's still a lot of emotion around all of this. So none of it is is easy. Um, and then uh, so you know, we did that, but we did also did lawsuit streamlining because the problem is. Uh, right now with our, uh, our CEQA uh, regime um, that people can sue to stop housing projects, also infrastructure. And we did some streamlining, but really it's really lawsuit streamlining, just saying, hey, if you're going to have a lawsuit, it has to be decided in this time frame. Again, so stuff just doesn't expand to be years and years and years and years. Uh, we tried a couple other uh, pieces, um, Ida Bill SB 420 and Senator Padilla uh, 619, uh, those did get vetoed um, you know, by the governor, and he said, hey, the PUC is going to be working on these. So we're saying, okay, we'll work with the PUC to um, see how the PUC then step up and, and do some of the streamlining itself, and hopefully that will happen. Um, but it's a current, you know, it's a, it's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a constant uh, battle, right? And, and you know, that's why we want to also incent uh, more solar close and more renewables close to urban loads. Um, but the reality is we are building a lot of it uh, far away from urban loads, and we have to work on that transmission infrastructure. Senator Stern? Well, not to make the stakes too high on a sort of in-the-weeds question, but I honestly think we're, we're undergoing a test in democracies around the, the world as to whether this form of government can rapidly process industrial change at a pace and scale that's necessary and not abandon those sort of core principles of of you know of self determination of of you know sort of bottom up especially in this country and especially in this state local governments having a sort of primacy over basic health and safety police power things like that worrying about you that there's such a direct accountability there and yet um, what do you do in Shasta when a board of supervisors says we we don't like offshore wind or any wind uh, just because it's renewable energy and that's, that's what socialists do and, and they're gonna make a political thing out of a necessary addition to our energy grid. Um, or we're trying to add lithium to the mix. And we've got the local government say is bought in and most groups are bought in, but one group says, well, we wanna leverage more out of it or we want, you know, we want a, a better community mitigation package or we're gonna sue just to stop it just because we don't like you. Um, I think it's a big test especially for those of us who believe so deeply in direct democracy, to find smart ways to still build consent, right? We're not gonna do this like China. It's just not gonna be that way, and yet go at the speed and pace we need. So, you know, the renewable energy build out, I think now that CEC is authorized with a lot of centralized authority for siting is gonna be a great test of that. I also think that you know, folks like at the Air Board, you know, when, when they have so many stakeholders putting pressure on them to say, don't do, don't do this new project, don't do the carbon removal thing, don't, don't stick your nose into hydrogen, don't try in these spaces, um, I think we in politics need to build, especially in progressive politics, need to build enough durability for our leaders to say, hey, take a chance. Like, take a measured chance and don't go all in, and you don't have to buy everything and buy the you know, the, whatever this industry is telling you is necessary to make the transition, but let them try and let's see what they can do. 
And if industry then wants to say no and pump their brakes and say we're taking our toys and going home, they can do that. But if industry is saying, well, here's a solution, let's try it, I don't know. I don't think we can afford not to take some chances right now. So you mentioned China. Uh, Governor Newsom went to China. Yeah. Um, and despite some of the challenge between Washington, D.C. and Beijing. And, um, and there's what we do in California obviously has implications internationally. We are the fifth largest economy. So how do you think about, I know you're trying to solve the California problem. Tell us a little bit about how you're thinking about it um, from the international impact of this. And does that figure into your decision making out here? I mean, it's, it's central to how in our office we think about what's next when, when it comes to climate policy. I mean, it's why we moved climate disclosure legislation last year and spent three or four years working on it because we saw these accounting standards emerging all over the world around net zero transitions or you know, full scope one to three disclosure in Europe, in Japan, in Hong Kong, on, on, their, on their exchange, it's going up this year. Um, in Australia, Canada now, and yet the US, there was this gap. There was a leadership gap. So when there are chances to do both California first beneficial work and at the same time have these sort of positive export effects that we can do climate diplomacy indirectly through that work and build space for international progress, uh, we, we jump on that. I mean, those are, those are huge opportunities. So I don't think we can afford not to go to China. I think the governor was incredibly brave and, and it was such an important mission despite all the challenges and all the things that I hate that that government does, I also know we need them and we actually have things to learn from them too. And so, I don't know. I think we can't, just like we can't afford, say, not to deal with the oil and gas sector and go sort of head on at this fossil fuel transition, really, same thing with the rest of the world. We can't just tell ourselves, even though we are California elected senators and we have to serve our constituents first, if you're doing climate policy and you're not thinking about the rest of the world or even just the region, like with electric policy, and that we actually are part of a broader grid, a broader grid than we let on, a broader grid than we allow, and actually maybe we could find some economies of scale if we start to regionalize and share, that like those politics are hard, but this crisis demands us to break out of whatever our, you know, sort of ring fences in our life. Senator Baker, any thoughts? Uh, I think uh, Senator Stern, you know, captured it well. I just say that we, we do have to engage. Um, and uh, I went to Davos for the first time and, and, and you know, we, sh we, we learn from these areas. And I think a lot of these, uh, I think, uh, you know, um, I'm personally hopeful as a Democrat, the Democrats have all three uh, bodies of the, of the federal um, Congress and presidency going uh, forward. But if we don't, again, it's going to be come back to the state. So it's really the stuff that we're putting in place, the evidence-based best practice from the Nordics, and really taking that across leading edge climate states working together. California, Washington State, New York, yeah. Colorado, we all have to work together uh, collectively with these evidence-based best practices. Before we go into open question, just some quick note, Senator Stern, what would you tell the Henry Stern that is now there in UC Merced, or UC Davis, or somewhere in California? Um, we have a legislative aid position open. Uh, I can give you my email, and I really need you. I really need you, young Henry. These are great uh, jobs. I would love to intern for myself some days. Uh, I actually do that. I'm very affordable for myself, though, so I do a lot of, do a lot of talking points. Um, don't, I mean, there's, with the knowledge you're gaining here at Stanford, you will have the ability to make a lot of money in your life. You're, you're, you're touching on, I mean, the, mo the only market that's bigger in the world than energy is money. So you're, you're, in, you're in the money. Um, do something bold and, and go try to make not a lot of money for a, a bit, even <laughs> just for a bit in your life. Take a few years and try, try out just what service feels like, and it's an amazing, for me, my puzzle was always like, I want to get access to the room where it's happening. And I didn't really care, you know, was working for Waxman for, I think I made zero dollars on that job in the basement of, of Longworth writing those bills. And, and even for Senator Pavley, when I was writing her legislation, it was never that, it was just, we're moving a hundred trillion dollar global economy. So I, don't, don't, be, don't be sort of, 
thrown off when you look at you know, an energy commission job and compare that to a job in New York or you know, the private sector or Silicon Valley, even no offense to all my VC friends in the room, like I'm not trying to steal your people, but we need your people and we need them in government. And I think that you know, the pipeline's wide open um, for talent and I, I would encourage you, spend time, if not right away in your career, spend, spend a few years in service. You've watched your, you know, Dr. Majumdar do it. He and I have both done it, floated in and out of private sector, into government. Um, give it that time and be free at first. It's an easy way to start. Senator Becker for the young <laughs> Josh Becker at Stanford. Well, I'll just add, I think, I think Senator Storm captured well. I'll say that uh, there is a Stanford JD MBA brilliant uh, young kid who's going to come to Sacramento, and he's going to be, I believe, chief of staff to Chair Holtzschild. So we need to really um, get a lot more Stanford. By the way, for a while, I was actually the only Stanford grad in the whole legislature. Uh, I think now there are two. Um, in the whole legislature. Wow. So we really wow. do need to uh, increase that connectivity between uh, Stanford and um, Sacramento. Now that the recruiting session has yeah, been sorry. done, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna stand up so that I can see all of you. <laughs> okay, let's have some questions from the audience. Okay, yes sir. Hi, thank you so much for your service and thank you for- Is there a, just hold on because the people on, um, online. Oh uh, yes. I'm not recording this, right? And I'm going to come no, this good. direction. Good. This direction okay. is, yeah. Okay, and Peter then Fisk go there. from Lawrence Berkeley Lab and, and, and NAWI. Um, want to bring us to, to Sacramento in particular, if you'll indulge us with a little bit of an inside Sacramento advice. There's been several uh, legislative efforts for a climate bond in 2024. Yeah. And I know a lot depends on what the governor wants to do eventually. But for those of us who are kind of watching this and, and feeling like this could be a very important investment for the state, what a sentinel issues are you watching to indicate whether that bond is going to happen? Like, for example, may revise number or something like that. Is there anything like we should be watching? And then the second thing is, is there any general advice you have for us who believe that a climate bond in 2024 might be a really good thing for the state? Thank you. I am so grateful for that question. The Senate bond is mine, along with a few others here, uh, but we, we've been writing that for years and trying to get it done. I st $10 billion is undersized uh, when, you, when it comes to a trillion dollar liability over the next two decades, right? And that's, you know, it's at, a fi it's at 15 billion right now. I think the point is we can't afford not to invest. I would say don't watch for indicators. I would say advocate right now. And I don't think you need to be dissuaded by the current economic climate, because in fact, in budget years like this, when we do have to be lean, borrowing is smart. Um, and, and especially at the rates we get as a state, like that, we, we will lose money if we don't do this. And those of you who can help us make that fiscal case even clearer, that it's not actually a cost, but it's a cost not to do it, I think will, will be very helpful. But I would say don't, yeah, don't wait, don't watch, and don't be intimidated by, you know, what Sa Sacramento is, and you said may revise. No one knows what that is probably in this room, but it's, a, it's the revised budget for the governor after he's put the January proposal out there and, I, I would just say, come make a trip and let us know you need it. And uh, California is going to be underwater, on fire, without water. You know, you can get all biblical if you want to about it, <laughs> if we don't. And also advocating the legislature also with the governor's team, because he's balancing a housing bond, a, an education bond, and That's a climate it. bond. So advocate with the governor's team Governor's well. main. That's the main. Go see Gavin. Any questions Sorry, from Gavin. this side? Sorry. Yes, over there. <laughs> then I'm going to come to that side. Hello, Arun. Uh, my name is Jim Illick. I'm a Cal and Stanford alum, and my daughter's godfather is, is a very famous trombone player. Um, uh, <laughs> two questions. You can answer one of, either one of them. This, we have a $68 billion deficit in, 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 in California. How does that impact what we're trying to do with climate change? And secondly, if the presumptive, or it appears, GOP president that's, that's slated here in 2024 gets elected, how does that impact California? Yeah. Is there a risk involved out here? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll say we, we need to make sure that doesn't happen from my perspective. But um, the good news is, you know, um, Chigger Shaw has done a great job. A lot of manufacturing is being built in red states and blue states. So hopefully um, some of that continues at a federal level. Um, but at a state level, obviously, it, it affects us. 
Um, the governor committed, we collectively did about a $54 billion climate budget over, over five years. That's being pared back, but it's still about $48 billion over five years, so still substantial. And then also our greenhouse gas funds. So that's the thing to keep an eye on. We, we get about, about $4 billion a year from greenhouse gas funds, and, um, and at some point that you know, cap and trade has to be reauthorized. And so how can we make sure that we get the biggest bang for the buck for that, from a climate perspective, for that money? All right. On this side, any questions? Uh, you had this gentleman over here in the pink shirt. Uh, thanks so much. <clears throat> uh, my name is Shane Smith. Uh, I'm from Pasadena 100. We're a community coalition that's seeking to uh, get to 100% carbon-free electric power for the city of Pasadena by 2030. So uh, <laughs> thanks. Um, the room, uh, the previous panel was sort of a wash in irony as we listened to uh, utility executives talk about how important rooftop solar was, uh, distributed energy resources, uh, and how uh, they're going to be there to build a stronger grid and, and create more infrastructure that they get to charge us for. But um, unfortunately, I didn't get to challenge them directly. Uh, they're just hypocritical type of positioning on the, on the matter, but I'm really interested in your perspectives from a, uh, a policy and legislative uh, perspective in terms of what was going on there. I know you're probably acutely aware of the politics. Um, how should this room process that? It looks like rooftop solar has been gutted by uh, those utilities uh, with the net energy metering policies. So uh, what, what are your thoughts? Quick perspectives on that. Uh, it's probably take an hour to answer. Yeah, no, and, <laughs> and I don't think it's something that the legislature actually wrestled with so directly. It's an example where you, you sort of set some general direction and you say, come up with just and reasonable rates and rethink this stuff and kick it to the PUC. And their job is to be inherently conservative and the most rate protective they can be. So they think that they're saving the grid money. And, you know, the fallout that we're going to see, though, from whatever this quote-unquote market correction is, is going to have very human impacts. And I don't think they've thought that through. And I think it's a messy, messy plan right now at best. And it's going to hurt people at worst. So I think we got challenges. But I would say to you in Pasadena, though, like, look at your, in your own backyard, tough calls to be made, right? So you got Grayson, you got a big gas plants in your backyard. When you're trying to convince your, local, your municipal utility, hey, come with us here, and you go to them with just distributed generation, they're going to say, well, that doesn't, that doesn't meet that 500 megawatts we need at net peak hours. So how to win in those conversations and, and, and you know, win out with those, the, those you feel that are entrenched within the utility world and do the math in a way that you can win even in those municipal energy-making decisions, I don't know. It, it'll, it'll make or break whether that, those plants get extended forever. I don't know what you guys are going to do, but keep at it, please. We need you down there. Sarah Baker, any, any thoughts on that? No, cover it. We'll take one okay. more. Okay. Last question over there. Hi, uh, Tim Hayde from Scale Microgrid. So um, I want to follow up on the implementation question. And I think anyone who does this in the state of California knows that the regulatory environment is a bottleneck. Every time I talk to anyone at the CPUC, they say basically like we're overwhelmed, right? So we're not only in charge of the energy transition, but we're in charge of water and ride sharing and autonomous vehicles and all these other things. So what's happening in Sacramento to make sure the CPUC has the resources they need to effectively regulate this so we don't run into some of these issues moving mm -hmm. forward? Senator Becker, you want to take a shot? You know, it's a good question. First of all, I want to say, because we're going to run out of time, and we have to be in Sacramento to vote very shortly. So we have to be off on the road at 1130. So I'm Josh.Becker at scn.ca.gov. Henry's Henry.Stern at scn.ca.gov. Please uh, reach out to us after. Well, this is Bill introduction That's time. really us, by the way. That's really <laughs> us. I, I, I email him there. He yeah, emails there's me other stuff that doesn't get. But we're looking at all these issues. We're looking at um, the transmission. We're looking at a thermal heat and industrial and over the fence rule. There's all stuff we're looking at right now. Uh, tough question to answer, actually. I think Senator Stern might have a better answer. I mean, it's frustrating for us as well um, when we have stuff that is get, gets bottlenecked um, by the PUC. And um, I'm not sure I have great answers. So you're I, don't, I mean, I'm the, I'm the guy who wrote the microgrid bill, whatever, five, yeah. six years ago. I've been sitting here waiting, waiting, <laughs> waiting, waiting, waiting. 
Um, and I'm, I'm just one legislator. I'm not an entire multi-billion dollar market and people whose power keeps getting shut off every time it's windy and suddenly they can't get their oxygenator to work because their, their system's not on or the fire station loses power or people's houses burn down. So it's like real. I'm really frustrated. Uh, I don't think it's just a capacity thing. I do think at some point it's a, it's a leadership call and it's about who's appointed and sort of the direction, the, the first question that Arun teed up, which is if you're the governor or a leader in this state and you have to balance these issues, there's, I think there's an inherent judgment in there that like we can't afford, we, we, we still haven't won that economic argument that this is gonna make the grid stronger and at a cheaper rate than otherwise before. And I think the same thing with net metering, and I think the same thing with a lot of, you know, when we fired up the gas fleet or Diablo, like it gets real and um, it's hard to be a governor, and that's who's sort of one step above that PUC. And so if we can get it to make those transitions feel safe, reliable, and affordable and win that, um, it'll be sort of self-fulfilling. I think if we can pull it off here, we actually will save the world. So don't, 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 don't dismay, don't, don't, don't lose hope on it. It's like, if you can, when we, when we crack these nuts, like when we do it, 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 will, it will change everything. Senator Stern, Senator Becker, Thank you for your service. Thanks. Thank you. Let's give them a big round of applause.